11 at 4 p.m. This year, Landau Lectures will be given by Professor Hans Tolmer from Humboldt University in Berlin. Uh, Professor Tolmer is a well-known propolis, uh, and uh, in the beginning of the 90s, he uh, moved to the, think, to the field of uh, financial mathematics and became a um, main expert in this field in Germany and probably in the, the Europe. And um, he is a member of uh, um, uh, European Academy of Science, uh, um, and several German Academies of Science, um, such as Brandenburg and uh, <coughs> Baldina, and member of the uh, International Statistical Institute. And uh, in, uh, in 2000, it was uh, Congress, uh, European Congress of uh, Mathematicians in Barcelona, and uh, Professor Fellmer gave um, the lect plenary lecture there with the same type of probabilistic uh, aspects of uh, financial risks. So I hope that for this uh, time uh, something new is known and we'll uh, hear this. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Yuri. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you are already anticipating. <laughs> Okay, it's of course a great honor to be asked to give these lectures. Yeah, so this uh, title which, is, which works uh, every time, Probabilistic Aspects of Financial Risk. I am, as Juri said, at Humboldt University in Berlin. I'm also at a new research center of the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, which is called Mathematics for Key Technologies. Now, mathematics for key technologies, <coughs> in that case means there are several application areas. <coughs> One of them is finance. And so, the idea is to apply mathematics you know, to these uh, application areas. <coughs> but of course, to make it interesting, it's important that this is not a one-way street. You know, that, in that case, finance you know, <coughs> is okay as a source of new challenges and problems in mathematics. And I'll try to emphasize later in the lectures you know, some, some problems uh, which have been <laughs> generated um, by <coughs> the application to finance and are maybe of some intrinsic interest. <coughs> so there will be three lectures <coughs> today. Stochastic analysis of financial options. <coughs> This is an introduction to the setting. Uh, so Yuri asked me not to assume uh, anything, and I won't assume you know, that you are probabilist. I won't assume that you have heard uh, about uh, mathematical finance. So in a sense, I'll start from scratch. <coughs> the second lecture <coughs> will be quantifying the risk, a robust view. And the third on dynamics of risk measures. <coughs> Now, in finance, you see all the time pictures like this. <coughs> now, uh, it's not clear, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> oh, this way? Let me, now, let me check. <laughs> no, <laughs> this way is a real picture. And you see, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Each version looks somehow <laughs> realistic, and uh, yeah, this is what the I read. The going up is much better than the one <laughs> Yeah, makes you feel better, right? So this is the stock market in Sao Paulo for a period of uh, eight months in uh, 2003. If you look at the picture for a longer time span, here for a century, <coughs> doesn't look so, so different qualitatively. <coughs> If you look for a couple of hours, it also looks pretty much the same. So these are already some kind of invariance properties you see under scaling and rotation and whatever, which uh, suggest uh, a diffusion picture. 
Now, not all pictures are uh, uh, the same. Sometimes uh, something special happens. For example, here, maybe Yuri. Yuri knows what's going on there if he sees this picture. <laughs> because this was <laughs> August 91. Yeah, the coup, the coup. And the German stock market immediately no. went down by 10%. Then four days later, when things were settled, it went back as if <laughs> nothing had happened. Now this kind of the dramatic part. You see another part uh, which maybe you haven't paid attention to yet, <laughs> which is more persistent. And that was some minor change in the German tax structure, which made uh, stocks look a little bit less attractive <laughs> than a couple of days before. And uh, so you have these kind of external shocks and there is not much hope, of course, to do anything about such things <laughs> uh, mathematically. Now, the typical situation is this. Now, you have seen such a picture, and now you arrive at a point of time where you want to make some financial decision, some investment. And then, of course, you don't know how this picture is going to continue. Typically, different people tell you different stories, possible scenarios, which might now <coughs> occur. And so that's a typical situation. You have many possible scenarios. And big omega <laughs> will from now on denote such a class of possible scenarios. And as the picture suggests, omega <coughs> will typically be a pass space. For example, if you are tracking definancial assets, you could take the space of all continuous curves over a time interval. Big T will be our horizon <coughs> with values in RD or rather RD plus. If you admit jumps, in the model, well, you would switch from a space of continuous trajectories to a space of, say, right continuous trajectories, with possibly with jumps. If you look at interest rate instruments, at each time you see already a whole curve, not in time but in space, namely the term structure of interest rates depending on whether you're talking about three months, one year, 10 years. So in principle you see a whole curve, so very fast it gets fancy mathematically. So here you would take the space of continuous paths to describe the dynamics of such curves with values in the space of curves. <coughs> okay. Now at any rate, since you have uncertainty, the point is that several scenarios <laughs> and actually plenty of scenarios are possible. You can take now bets. Mm -hmm. And uh, financial bets in terms of stocks, bonds, currencies, and then uh, the whole hierarchy of things you could do. Uh, you enter the world of financial derivatives, you can use options, uh, contingent claims, so derivatives in the sense that uh, <coughs> they depend on some underlying basic assets. So that will be one topic uh, in the sequel, such derivatives. Now, what is the role of mathematics in this? Like in any other kind of bet analysis uh, done in probability theory, it certainly does not help to win a bet. And that's also true for mathematics in finance. But it does help a lot. It helps to clarify <coughs> the structure of a bet. So you can try to see whether a bet looks fair which typically means is a price okay? Does it even look favorable? Or does it look acceptable? Acceptable in a different perspective, not from the point of view of investor who is out, uh, hopefully, <laughs> to make a profit, but from the point of view of a supervising agency. There's a huge discussion and the whole process going on of uh, <coughs> uh, putting pressure on banks to be transparent uh, uh, towards the uh, supervising agency with their risk exposure. And so the issue is not so much is it favorable, but is it acceptable you know, from the point of view of a supervising agency. And this will involve mathematics, which will be mainly discussed in the second lecture. Then mathematics helps to modify the structure of a given bit 
yeah, using financial derivatives. For example, <coughs> if you take a position in some index here on the European stock market, Euro stocks, and if the price now is here, then you enter here, so at the moment your net result is zero, and then at the final time, big T, the index may have moved, and the position just in the index, well, the net result is given by this straight line. And you may not like this, because uh, you, know, you may not like the possibility of ending down here, so you may prefer a profile like this, where here you have put in a floor to protect you against losses, and that's easily done by <laughs> getting <laughs> a position in the index, and at the same time a put option which, okay, I will explain what the put option is a little later, but the outcome is a net, the red net position. Well, you have discount certificates <coughs> where you get it cheaper, <coughs> and then the net outcome will be something like this. It looks better in this area than the blue one, but then <coughs> in case the index really moves up uh, considerably, then you are not participating in that part. <coughs> so, <coughs> There are many ways of modifying the structure of a given bet uh, by derivatives, and that means financial products are being offered which offer you whatever you want. And then mathematics also, it, at least the literature and mathematical finance, is involved a lot in the question, okay, what would be an optimal structure you know, given certain preferences, certain levels of risk tolerance, and so on. And that creates a lot of room for mathematicians in the financial industry. Some time ago, Le Monde had this cartoon where you see a traditional banker being surrounded by these guys, and one of them <laughs> taps him on the shoulder and says, well, we are sorry to tell you, Mr. Barry Moore, but you are no longer part of our equations. And this was part of an article which, with the title, uh, saying mathematics is colonial, colonializing the world of finance. And uh, they gave some numbers, and one number I found particularly striking. Uh, as you know, France has a very elitist upper layer of the educational system, uh, the Grands Écoles, and 15% of the people coming out of the Grands Écoles are now going into finance which is quite a, quite a lot, and so you might start to wonder whether that's a reasonable allocation of intellectual resources <laughs> in the society, but that's uh, what happens. Now, what do these mathematicians do? <coughs> now, they use models. Now, I'll show you a typical model. So, we are having pictures like this, here for a single stock. Set of scenarios is a pass space. <coughs> We have information available up to time t. This is being described by the Sigma algebra of events on that basic set of scenarios. Then often you don't want to look directly at the price as it stands, but you argue in terms of a fixed numeraire, for example, in terms with respect to a given savings account with a risk-free rate of interest r. So <coughs> these are the prices then you are going to discuss. <coughs> then the next heroic step would be to put a probability measure mm, on such a space of scenarios. Now that's of course a big step. Now mathematically this has been a big step in the early part of the last century you know, to learn how to handle probability measures on such pair spaces. In other words, to develop exact models for stochastic processes. And whenever you have, and in financial terms, it's heroic no, to write down a model, but because I mean, you are never quite sure, quite sure whether it's really so good. In any case, once you have fixed such a probability measure, you have a prediction scheme. You can compute expect expectations, expected values, or conditional expectations at time little t, <coughs> given the information up to time t, you can compute here a conditional expectation for the payoff at the final time t of some financial contract, some financial instrument. So this would be a random variable, a scenario-dependent payoff, <coughs> an option, for example, 
And uh, in such a model, you can compute, in principle, such uh, conditional expectations. Now, is this a key to pricing? So the classical idea would be, OK, this looks like a good candidate for a fair price. No, it, it varies no, uh, depending on the scenario. The probabilities of uh, different scenarios have been fixed. So this looks like a fair price. <laughs> Now, uh, it will turn out that this is not, not, uh, not the correct uh, way to start <laughs> uh, and that the answer may actually be quite different. Now, as to this step, fixing a model, uh, he, here is a good guideline by one of the gurus. Uh, to fix a model means you're ready now to forecast, to, to compute uh, conditional expectations. Uh, but our ability to forecast is limited, and we have to have some humility. Now, what does that mean in mathematical terms? Uh, this will be the subject of uh, the second lecture. At the moment, we are doing, as everybody does, they, 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 use, they decide to use a model. <coughs> and, uh, yeah, what, what should one take? And there is a long history to that. <laughs> and Brownian motion, which is suggested by this picture, immediately pops up. And we are celebrating uh, this year in particular, um, well, the great paper by Einstein on Brownian motion. But you may have heard that Brownian motion has appeared actually in a different context, namely the financial context, five years earlier, in a thesis by Bachelier. Theorie de la Speculation in Paris, where Brownian motion was invented, <coughs> being written down as a model for price fluctuation on the Paris stock market. And the precise mathematical construction of Brownian motion as a probability measure on a path space, namely the space of continuous function over the time interval from 0 to t, well, that construction is due to Wiener in 19. 23, so we know there is a unique measure it's called Wiener measure on path space such that the increments are independent and Gaussian <coughs> under that measure. So this is standard Brownian motion, this is this normalization. Increments are centered and the variance is equal to the length of the time interval. And there are many modifications of course nowadays. Well, the first step taken in the 60s was to put Brownian motion on a logarithmic scale that's sometimes called the Black-Scholes model because it's the context in which the Black-Scholes formula is being derived. Uh, but in fact, uh, this was not proposed by Black-Scholes first. That was propagated by Samuelson already <coughs> since the very, very early 60s and then Black and Scholes in the late 60s did their analysis <coughs> of option prices in that context. <coughs> well, <coughs> if you are ready to use Brownian motion up to a random time change, for example, volatility or the transaction volumes may be used to define an uh, intrinsic clock of the trajectory and, and you may, may look uh, along your trajectory with this different clock. And uh, that opens the door to a huge, to a huge uh, 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 number of models. In fact, uh, as we are going to see a little later, anything which is reasonable in mathematical finance can be identified as some possibly very complicated, not very useful, random time change of a basic Brownian motion. <coughs> You can start from scratch and say, no, no, we, are, we don't want to look at, at such continuous uh, things. That's already a mesoscopic scale. We want really to look in the fine time structure of an order book, where orders come in, <coughs> buys and sell orders. So if you look at the microstructure, microstructure <coughs> of uh, such financial time series, uh, you would start differently, maybe then end up no, by some invariance principle with models of this type. You may think of things like fractional Brownian motion. Here I have put down a warning sign. It will turn out that this is somewhat debatable, <coughs> but uh, why we are going to see later. Now, 
you see all these models, it's a huge industry you know, in producing all kinds of modifications and testing them on data, uh, econometricians are involved, statisticians are involved, <laughs> but there are also some theoretical arguments and from a mathematical point of view it's these theoretical arguments which, uh, <laughs> which create uh, interesting questions. <laughs> There's something called the efficient market hypothesis. <laughs> It comes in a strong form and in a more flexible form. The strong form says that the discounted price process is a martingale, which is a mathematical notion uh, making precise the idea of a fair game. And that means at each time if you predict a future price increment, it should be zero. So the expected net gain given information up to time s should be zero. Sometimes it's also called, which would be a special case of this, the random walk hypothesis. There are books with the title, a random walk down Wall Street, and things like that. Now, we can rewrite it in the following form. Xs is equal to the conditional expectation of uh, some future price. And in this form, it's a rough equilibrium argument saying, okay, if the, in some sense, aggregate expectation of the market of the future price, already discounting uh, uh, by the interest rate, would be higher than the present price that immediately would push the price up and conversely, so it's a rough, very rough uh, uh, equilibrium argument. <coughs> what is the market? Hmm? The market. Do, do we distinguish between the market and the brown end motion? No, the, yeah, the Brownian motion is, is, uh, is the price fluctuation you see. Yeah, and the market, uh, <laughs> and this is driven by, by, by people's expectations on the market. In some sense, the price which comes out is a complicated aggregate no, of the microstructure of the market where plenty of agents are around with different perceptions and... and uh, so this is, 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 is somewhat mythical. No? It's kind of an aggregate, <laughs> aggregate of many individual expectations. In the number of brown emotions, of independent brown emotions. Is there, is there a connection? Ah, okay. No, at the moment I'm speaking just about one. I focus just on one single stock or index or whatever you like. <coughs> No, this <coughs> assumption would have rather drastic financial consequences. So if P has this property that with respect to P the price fluctuation has a martingale property, then let's call P a martingale measure. In the first place, that would already show why the paths are so crazy as we see them. So if you have a model with continuous paths and if you have a martingale measure, then the paths cannot be of bounded variation. It's by a theorem of Levy that if a continuous martingale would have paths of bounded variation, then it would be trivial, just stay put, constant paths. As soon as it moves, it must move in this crazy way. <coughs> On the other hand, then there can't be strategies with positive expected gain relative to the risk-free rate of return, and that's a basic theorem about martingale's uh, dupe system theorem. For example, if you have a buy and hold strategy, you could try to stop, to sell, at a moment which looks good to you. So you would apply a stopping time, technically speaking. And one version of Duke's system theorem is that there is no stopping time, if you have a martingale, which changes the, the character of the thing. I mean, expectation of the gain would be zero, no matter what you are. And uh, it's very easy to see why this uh, theorem holds. So <laughs> I'm not assuming that you have seen any probability, but I use this to explain a little bit more precisely what I mean by a trading strategy. For example, buy low, sell high. No? Uh, all the time you read recommendations of that type, no, it would be reasonable to buy low. <laughs> okay, now what does that mean? You fix some levels A and B, you wait until the fluctuation is below. So here I have put a discrete observation time, so you look at these observation times, first time you are below, you buy. Then you wait until the first time you are above B, then you sell. Then again, you wait until you are low, and then you sell. So with this trajectory, 
you have done this twice before the end of t, and you have twice made a profit at least equal to the interval b minus a, which looks good. Of course, it could have happened that the trajectory here before your deadline has not come up, then okay, then, then uh, you may have actually lost something if you end up below the <coughs> price where you have bought it. So in general, a trading strategy, say in discrete time, would mean at a given time you decide you know, on the number of units of the given stocks you are going to hold in the next time interval. And this, of course, has to be non-anticipating. It can only depend on the information so far. And if you do that, this is your cumulative net gain. Uh, in each little interval, time interval, this is a price increment multiplied with the number of stocks you hold in that interval, and you make that net profit. Now, if you have a martingale measure, the expectation of this net gain is the sum of the single expectations but the expectation of something like that is equal to the expectation of the conditional expectation given FTI. This is already measurable because it's non-anticipating. You can treat it like a constant, pull it out, and this here is zero by the Martingale property, and so you get zero no matter what you do. So this is Stoops system theorem, and <coughs> that means that <laughs> it's a minority view uh, among the financial community that the, uh, that the uh, uh, martingale hypothesis, that the efficient market hypothesis holds in this form, because otherwise people getting high salaries uh, would have trouble justifying uh, this fact, since no matter what they do, uh, on average, uh, they can't uh, uh, do much. Now, and in reality, <laughs> you sometimes get the impression that reality is not so far away from that strong form. Now here comes the majority view. The, this is a broad consensus in financial mathematics. You want at least to assume the weak form, or a much more flexible form of the efficient market hypothesis, and that means there are no free lunches. Now what is a free lunch or an arbitrage opportunity? That would be a strategy which gives you a positive expected gain and it does so without any downside risk. So it means in the end you are sure, almost surely, in your model to be <coughs> come out on the safe side and also the expectation is strictly positive. So there may be strategies with positive expected gain. So you are not insisting on the strong form, but you exclude those uh, the existence of strategies with positive expected gain, which in addition have this property. You know, this is one of the fundamental theorems in the field, started with Krebs and Harrison, then Delbert and Schachermeyer did it in great generality, and Jan at the ICM 2002 gave a very nice version of uh, uh, the theorem. <coughs> this is equivalent to the fact that there exists a martingale measure, P star, which is equivalent to the given model. Equivalent in the measure theoretic sense, so the null sets are the same. So roughly speaking, the same scenarios are found significant in both, in both uh, models. No? So the null sets are the same, or the sets of positive measure, which are significant in that sense, are the same. So the model itself may not, may allow for strategies with positive expected gain, but uh, there is an equivalent change of measure into a martingale situation. So what is the measure you change? What, hmm? what measure do you change? The given measure. So we have fixed some model P. I'm going to show you example, an example in a minute. And uh, in this model, you may allow for strategies which give you some positive expectation. But um, yeah, and uh, uh, one direction is easy. If you have that, then it's clear that you can't have free lunches because uh, if you have this property under P, you also have it under the equivalent measure P star. But for P star, we know that the expectation of the outcome should be zero. 
And if it's also non-negative p star almost surely, it must be zero p star almost surely. But then again, by equivalence, it must be equal to zero p almost surely. And so this cannot be. No? So this is the easy direction. The difficult direction is the other way around. It involves some separation arguments, so a mix of probability, stochastic analysis, uh, and functional analysis. <coughs> So here's a concrete example that is sometimes called the Black-Scholz model or geometric brown emotion. <coughs> uh, you can write it down in this form. And uh, here you have some predicted rate of return. Here you have some volatility parameter. In that case, you can switch it into a martingale measure by a Gersanov transformation which takes away the drift which appears here so that under p star you have simply such an equation with some w star which is now a Wiener process under p star. And in that case also it's easy to see that the equivalent martingale measure is unique. In general the fact that we have an equivalent martingale measure has the following consequences. It still explains no, the, that the paths are crazy because that's a path property no, which uh, remains the same if you don't change the null sets. Then by a basic theorem of De La Chery, such a semi-martingale is a stochastic integrator. Even though the paths are crazy and not of bounded variation, so you can't do normal integration on these paths, you can do stochastic integration. And also, by a fundamental theorem of Monroe, which was the end of a long series of papers showing that all kinds of processes can be viewed as time changes of Brownian motion, says that every semi is a time change Brownian motion. So the weak form of the efficient market hypothesis shows that your model must be, maybe in a very fancy way, a random time change of a Brownian motion. And it means that Eto calculus works. So you can now apply stochastic calculus. Eto calculus means that these quantities which we have seen already, so the <coughs> net gain of a non-anticipating trading strategy, these things, as you refine the partition, converge, in a reasonable sense, to Ito's stochastic integral. And so Ito's stochastic integral, being the limit of non-anticipating agreement sums, admits in a very natural way a financial interpretation as a net gain generated by the trading strategy appearing here. Moreover, let's now collect some facts. In such models, such models admit a quadratic variation. For a typical pass, at least for models, uh, nice models based on Brownian motion, for example, for Brownian motion itself, uh, the quadratic variation exists in this sense, uh, say for long dyadic partitions, and is, in the case of Brownian motion, <coughs> deterministic, equal to t. In the Black-Scholz model, the quadratic variation also exists in this sense and is equal to this. And then Ito's formula says that for a nice function, you can now compute along the path of such a trajectory you know, the behavior of a function depending on price and time in this way. Here are the classical Newton-Leibniz terms and here is an additional term driven by the quadratic variation. Actually, such a formula holds in full generality in the following sense. The Ito integral works in full generality in the setting if this function, the derivative fx, is locally in L2. And a question which puzzled us for a while, why can't we read identify <laughs> the quantity appearing here in that general case where the rest of the formula makes sense? And it can be interpreted as a covariation, where this is defined in analogy to the thing above. So in analogy, you define x, y you know, for two processes. And uh, so that was a joint paper with Prota and Shoyayev. OK, you uh, must be in some sense aware of Ito's work, because Ito got the Wolf Prize here in 
Israel. Um, and uh, the Laudatio underlines you know, the really fundamental contribution here. And I just want to make one remark. Here is a picture of Ito in 42. So that was about the time where he did this work. <coughs> now you may have heard that uh, a little bit more than two years ago there was a, a kind of sensation in the history of probability because a letter was opened in the Paris Academy of Sciences which had been sealed and deposed by Wolfgang Dublin, son of uh, Alfred Dublin, the writer of Berlin Alexanderplatz, who emigrated to France, uh, was in the, became a mathematician there. And uh, while he was with the French army, he wrote a paper sur l'Ecation de Kolmogorov, but just a handwritten manuscript. And that was in that envelope. And in that manuscript, there is Ito's formula, except not the stochastic integral, but there's Ito's formula with the correct second order term. And he does not have the theory of stochastic integration, but he represents the martingale part, no, which, as a, which in Ito's formulation is a stochastic integral, as a time change of Brownian motion. So a very modern paper, and so uh, one could probably start to, to rename the formula the Dublin uh, Ito formula. <coughs> So now we come to financial options. We have talked about underlying models. Now financial options give you some payoff depending on the scenario. A call option is a contract which allows you to buy at a price which is fixed already now at, in the European version, the final time t. And the net outcome is you are not going to use that option if the actual price, if it's cheaper to buy it directly, only if the market price at that time is higher, then you are going to exercise the option, and that is then <laughs> the outcome, the positive part of that difference. Here's a put option, here's a more subtle thing, a look back option, where at the end of the interval you get paid the maximum of the price. But that's something which is very elusive. No? That's something you cannot catch by a buy and hold strategy. Because if you arrive here, you don't know whether this is already the maximum or whether it will further go up. So it's elusive from the classical point of view of buy and hold strategies and stopping at the right moment. No, you can't catch it that way. But you can buy a contract which gives you the maximum. Except you will pay more for that at time zero than, than uh, just the actual price. And the question is, what is the correct price? What is the correct price for the privilege of, in retrospect, being happy of having really the best which could have been done? Now, the role of these options is twofold. Uh, they are instruments of portfolio insurance. I've given you already one example. Um, and they also can be used uh, per se, with a high leverage effect. But let's now look at the problem of pricing and hedging. So the classical actuarial approach would say the fair price should be the expectation in your model, maybe plus some risk premium. And the answer by Black Shorts is no, you should do something different. But then we are going to see, well, uh, that's not the last word, and in some sense, these classical considerations will come back in a way. Now, it's clear-cut in the ideal case of a so-called complete model. Now, completeness by definition means, for us, uniqueness of the equivalent Martingale measure. And we have seen one example, the simple geometric Brownian motion model is of that type. By theorems which were proven before <laughs> Any, anybody in this milieu was thinking about finance. First step was the fundamental representation theorem of Ito, that functionals of Brownian motion can always be written as stochastic integrals of Brownian motion. And Jacques Dior showed that uniqueness of the equivalent Martingale measure is equivalent to that fact. Now that fact means 
you have here some functional of the underlying process and it can be written as a stochastic integral. So a constant plus uh, this integral. In financial terms, that means here is the net result of a trading strategy and it means you can find a strategy which produces at the end of the day exactly the outcome of your financial contract and that means you have a perfect replication in terms of a trading strategy on the underlying process. And this constant is the cost of replication. Well, that's the initial amount you need to make it work. You can now integrate this equation by the unique equivalent martingale measure. The integral has itself then the martingale property. The expectation will be zero, so the constant will be equal to the arbitrage-free price. And so we have found a canonical arbitrage-free price. It's the expectation under the equivalent martingale measure, which in general is different from the expectation under uh, the objective model you started out with. Yeah, you can do um, this argument um, in purely analytical terms, uh, but I'm going to skip that by using the pathwise Ito integral. Yeah, okay, no, I want to use it later, so I'll just show it to you. So let's take a Black Scholes type model where, under the objective measure, the process uh, uh, satisfies the stochastic equation of that type, where WT is a Wiener process. Under the equivalent Martingale measure, the drift has disappeared and you have a simple equation driven by that new Brownian motion W star under P star. And the price only depends on P star, but P star has thrown out the drift. So in particular we see the drift in your model, model does not matter, but the volatility does. Volatility means this factor, sigma of T, and uh, this gives you the quadratic variation. And now if you have an option of this simple type, a function of the final stock price, as in the case of call option, then <laughs> analytically you solve here a simple partial differential equation. You extend uh, this to a solution here on this space-time strip. You apply strictly pathwise Ito formula for trajectories which admit a quadratic variation of that type. <coughs> Let's call this class of continuous function uh, in this way and then by Ito's formula you get this and the rest drops out. It's a function you have constructed here as a solution of this equation and you have a perfect replication. Now in general the computation of the integrant which means the trading strategy for simple options works as I just described via PDE Ito calculus for exotic options like look back options and other complicated things depending on the whole path, not only at the final value. You can use Maliavin calculus, for example, the Clark Bismuth O'Connor formula for uh, computing uh, the integrant. Okay, so far we have seen some high tech methods, in particular on the last slide, with, uh, I didn't even try to explain them, from stochastic analysis, but well known. But, uh, they can be applied, but they were well known already before, before this business of mathematical finance started. So these are examples of the arrow in one direction, uh, from mathematics to this application area. No economics was involved, except the short discussion of the absence of arbitrage. That's one reason that many mathematicians went into this area because uh, they were quite happy to see, aha, we don't have to go uh, through microeconomics whatsoever. But it's a sort of a short-term feeling, uh, not, not sustainable in the long run. And we have seen that <coughs> with this idea of perfect replication, the risk has completely evaporated on the level of derivatives because the whole idea was to 
to devise a strategy which matches it perfectly and so there's no intrinsic risk of the level of derivatives. <laughs> now that's somehow the wrong signal <laughs> because all this is was mathematically of course correct but it worked in a complete financial market model. <coughs> and realistic models are typically incomplete. And incomplete by definition means not the equivalent Martingale measure is not unique and then because it's a convex set, it means you have infinite, infinite number of equivalent martingale measures. And by a real realistic, I mean <laughs> there are more sources of uncertainty than traded assets. And, yeah, and that's probably, <laughs> probably always so, always so. So I'm a strong believer in incompleteness. For example, in discrete time, just a one period model, here's the simplest model you could do. Initial price, the, the stock goes up or the stock goes down. Just two possibilities with some probability P. There is a unique equivalent martingale measure which turns this into a, the discounted process in terms of the interest rate. It's given by the success probability P star if the model is arbitrage free to begin with and that means the interest rate must lie between these bounds. As soon as you admit one more possibility, and you have here, we are talking about one financial risky asset plus a savings account, it's no longer complete. It's incomplete. You have here a whole interval of, of uh, equivalent martingale measures because you have many choices of putting some mess on this scenario and then distributing the remaining mess so that the whole thing becomes a martingale. That's a simple case. And in models, as we saw, so Black-Scholz type models, as soon as you admit what is usually the case, that you do not know in advance your volatility profile. The volatility profile is uncertain, <coughs> and you may then want to model that in itself as a stochastic process, completeness breaks down. If you admit jumps, so for all kinds of reasons, the reality of financial markets is highly incomplete. So we have to deal with many martingale measures at the same time, and that means the representation theorem breaks down, intrinsic risks appear on the level of derivatives, preferences come back, <laughs> microeconomics comes back, many approaches you find in the literature are utility-based, and um, okay. Now mathematically, this is now interesting. So in view of pricing and hedging of derivatives, <coughs> let's look at hedging. So we have a contingent claim, we have some initial capital, and we want to so think in terms of the seller of the option, the bank which has sold the option. They want to be prepared at the final moment when they have to, to, to pay out you know, whatever uh, the contract says. So they want to use some hedging strategy. So what, what is hedging? Hedging means you, you use a strategy on the underlying assets on the stock market, uh, if the derivative refers to these underlines, <coughs> and you play around uh, by, by some trading strategies, as I described earlier. And that will give you a net final result, uh, your initial amount, the net result of the trading strategy. And <coughs> typically, you will have, I mean, before, in the complete case, you can choose CT such that you match perfectly. But in general, you will have a hedging error. And so the question is, what do we do now? Um, a, the idea is to keep the hedging error small. Yeah, you can uh, try to keep it small in some, uh, for example, in L2, the idea of mean variance hedging. Or what is more appropriate, uh, because if you, if you have too much in the end, you are very relaxed. You are nervous only if you have not enough. So it's an asymmetry and you want to focus on the downside rather. So the shortfall is interesting. Extreme approach insists, as before, on really in the end being absolutely on the safe side. So zero tolerance for shortfall risk. If you do that, The idea is super hedging, <coughs> and that's a very extreme approach. And mathematically, it works like this. 
at each time t you compute the conditional expectation of your final claim, given the information up to time t, for an equivalent martingale measure, and you take the soup. If there's only one, that would be the canonical price of the derivative at time little t. Here we take the soup. That process is a super martingale, which means martingale with an inequality. The present value is above the conditional expectation <coughs> for each such measure. So it's a universal super martingale for a whole class of measures, in that case the class of martingale measures. Now, this is now a piece of mathematics which has been motivated by the application, but which is of interest uh, uh, in its own right. Namely, uh, prove a structure theorem for such universal super martingales, <coughs> which extends the classical Dupmeyer decomposition of a super martingale. And here is uh, what comes out. You can show that there exists a trading strategy such this super martingale, this universal super martingale has this form, this initial constant plus uh, the result of your hedging strategy, the net result, minus some increasing process. And this extends the Dupre-Yer <coughs> decomposition, which would say you can represent the super martingale as a martingale minus an increasing process. This is strong property to be simultaneously a super martingale for all martingale measures, and the effect is that the martingale part in the Dupmeier decomposition here is identified as a stochastic integral of the underlying process X, which defines uh, the class P star. And in financial terms, <coughs> this means that the derivative can be represented in this form, initial cost plus net gain, and then at the end you get the cumulative refund. So that was a piece of new mathematics which came out of this. Here again, you can do a probability-free discussion of superhedging in certain situations in analogy to what I described before by solving a nonlinear partial differential equation, a Pucci equation, and, uh, but I'm going to skip that. At any rate, typically, what happens here with super hedging is an approach which is too extreme. Because uh, if you compute the price, the cost of super hedging, it usually turns out to be too high to be uh, practical. And the whole idea, the whole philosophy to want to stay almost surely on the safe side is extremely conservative, of course. And it's more conservative than any actuary would be. And this is a very conservative community. An actuary would always admit some small epsilon no, ruin probability, no, sufficiently small, so would not insist on, on really zero tolerance. So from the applied point of view, the mathematically it's interesting. From the applied point of view, one might say, okay, not so interesting because not really <coughs> practical. But the technique of superhedging turns out to be an important building stone for other approaches which may be more practical. For example, efficient hedging. <coughs> you reduce cost and in turn you have to then accept some risk. For example, you could say uh, let's minimize the shortfall risk. Yeah, how do we define the shortfall risk? Here is one way of doing it, not the only one. Here we have the shortfall, you do some, you use some strategy, the net outcome together with your initial capital is VT, that's the shortfall, the positive part of that difference. You apply a convex loss function and you take the expectation and you want to minimize that under some cost constraint. Yeah, and this you can solve in two steps. Um, you first solve a certain static problem, which is mathematically related to the name and Pearson theory of uh, statistical tests. You find uh, some phi between 0 and 1, so that this is quantities being minimized. And then you take the modified claim 
where you scale it down you know, by multiplying with a factor smaller than or equal to one, and this you superhedge. And that turns out to be the optimal solution. Yeah, this, by the way, is an example uh, of a specific problem you have if you have graduate students in mathematical finance. He was very strong and he got his PhD, but then he moved on uh, because he got offers he could not, he felt he could not refuse from McKinsey, and he is now a partner with McKinsey, so since uh, a year and a half, which means he is financially in a very different dimension of what any university could offer. Now, <coughs> a special case would be of this approach, quantile hedging, <coughs> where you simply say, okay, let's maximize the probability of coming out all right with our hedging procedure under some cost constraints. That would be a special case. And in general, the question is, okay, how, what, these were ad hoc ways of talking about the risk which you want to minimize. And this raises a general question, how should we quantify the risk of a financial position? We have seen two specific ways, but what if we start from scratch and start to think systematically about what does it mean, no, to, uh, what are reasonable measures, consistent measures of the financial risk of a financial position. And this will be the topic then of the next lecture. So I'll stop here. Yeah, yeah, he, he, he would like fractal brown emotion, yeah. Now, some people take, take the dogmatic point of view because fractal brown emotion admits arbitrage opportunities, we don't want to consider it. For example, Chris Rogers, who wrote a paper explicitly identifying arbitrage opportunities in a fractal brown emotion model, would take that tough point of view. I'm not taking that tough point of view. I think it's interesting because the arbitrage opportunities which you can identify are not really very practical. Uh, they would involve going really into the fine time structure in a way which in reality you can't really do. In reality you are, you are always, you are always uh, essentially in a discrete time setting. And then, if you take the discrete time, time uh, version of fractional Brownian motion, then it's okay. Then you can construct equivalent Martingale measures. And it captures some phenomena which, which are relevant. And, and what, what is, uh, would be interesting and is, is being done by various groups is to understand better the issue in terms of microstructure models. So that's one of the big chapters which I'm not going to talk about, microstructure modeling. You try to really model the interaction of agents on a financial market <laughs> in, in, with a view towards herding effects and uh, you know, obviously very relevant uh, real phenomena and then you try to derive by some kind of invariance principle certain mesoscopic diffusion models like for example fraction ground motion but I think that's still missing a convincing microstructure model which in the limit you know, argues and makes a case for fractional ground motion. Last, uh, yes. 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 Yeah, this, I, uh, this one can solve with a two-step procedure just as in the more general case which I described before. So you first solve a Neyman Pearson type statistical testing problem and then you super hedge you know, the modified claim uh, which comes out of that. It's under the completeness assumption. No, 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 that's, 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 now, that's now in general. As in general, uh, well, you show existence and uniqueness of a solution to really compute it. Uh, in the incomplete case, it's somewhat troublesome uh, case studies. Yeah, one can say something. But that's a computational issue. In principle, it's existence and uniqueness of the solution is okay. My question 